The first lesson for this second Sunday in the season of Advent is taken from the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will, be a like, he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of our Lord. The Holy Gospel is recorded from the book of Luke chapter 3, the first six verses. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill be made low, every, the crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace and mercy and peace are all God's gifts to you through Jesus Christ, God's Son and our Savior. Amen. Our text for this morning is taken from the first lesson, the first reading from Malachi. The last book, the last prophet who worked in the times of the Old Testament about 400 years before Jesus. Malachi chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 where Malachi gives us kind of a, a secret for peace in our lives as Christians. Dear brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who gives us hope, as the first candle represents, who also gives us peace, as today's candle represents. The number one reason that people today seek out counseling or therapy is Anybody? Depression. Number one reason that people flock to counselors and therapists because they are depressed in one form or fashion. Do you know what the number two reason right behind depression is? Anxiety. No peace, a lack of peace at least. And it comes in all shapes and sizes and forms and it's sometimes more debilitating than other times not as debilitating, but it's still something that people seek out treatment for or help for. You can't sleep at night. You can't concentrate during the day. You don't have that calm, peaceful feeling that you want to have during your life. And why not? Because you have anxiety. You have this, this quest for peace that your, your, your body is searching for, that your soul is searching for, that your mind is searching for, but you just don't have that peace in your life. And it's brought on by any number of different reasons. In school, <clears throat> 
students are, are studying for an exam. The professor or the teacher says, this is a very important exam. It's going to count for a third of your grade. That's a lot of weight when it comes to your final grade. And so the student will study and study and study, but walk into that test on that particular day, and they still feel overwhelmed by anxiety. You're looking for a new job, and you finally get an a interview granted to you, and you walk into your potential employer or your potential boss, and what do you have? An overwhelming sense of anxiety. If you're getting ready for a piano recital and and you're not the first one on the program, which is always the best place to be because you're done and it's over with, but you're somewhere towards the end and, and the next person goes up and comes down, the next person goes up, comes back down, and then it's your turn. And all, the whole time your hands have been getting more sweaty and more sweaty and your heart has been beating faster and faster and faster. You finally get up, you sit down at that piano and you take a deep breath. And what are you feeling? You're feeling the nerves. You're feeling no peace whatsoever. You're feeling the effects of anxiety in your life. But what helps in many of those situations? There's one thing that that will help to a degree in each and every single one of those situations. If you have the opportunity to study for that exam and you go over that material and you make that material your own and you study and you go beyond the chapter in the book, it's feeling a whole lot better when you walk into that test, isn't it? Or or, or when you've prepared a, a, a good job resume and you've gone over in your head, this is what I'm going to say, and you've prepared kind of in your mind, this is what I'm going to tell this person if he or she asks me this question, you feel a little bit more at peace as you walk into that job interview. Or in piano lesson, or if you've got a recital of whatever kind of recital that you're going to have, if you have gone over that piece and you know that piece inside and out, if you haven't just gone over the, 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 the times where, where you don't get this particular phrase and, and, and say, you know what, I don't get it anyways, but you work at it note after note and phrase after phrase and line after line, you will walk into that piano recital a whole lot more calm and a whole lot less stressed than if you would if you're going in there not being prepared, not winging it, as people say today. Preparation brings peace, or at least a little bit more peace than you would have if you did not prepare. Today we're going to look at a, a, a much weightier situation than any of those three situations that I just mentioned, because it is talking about our eternal destiny, our eternal fate. Where are we going to spend eternity in this life? As we confess in the creed, Christ is coming to do what? To judge the living and the dead, the quick and the dead in the old version. Christ is coming to do that on Judgment Day someday. And, and Malachi asked this question, who can endure the day of Christ's coming? That's a really sobering, chilling question, isn't it? Who can endure the day when Christ is going to come back to judge the living and the dead, you and me included? What's the answer to that question? Only those who are prepared. Only those who by repentance and faith and receiving Christ's forgiveness by faith are prepared to meet Christ when he comes again on the last day. And, and those who are prepared, they're going to enjoy the peace that passes understanding, the peace that escapes a whole lot of people on that judgment day someday. The prophet Malachi lived about 400 years again before Jesus walked on the face of this earth. Prophet Malachi was sent to the people who had returned from exile. Remember, back in 722, the northern kingdom of Israel had been carted off into exile into Assyria. And in 586, the, the year that Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians, the Babylonians had carted off hundreds of thousands of, of Jewish people back up to the, to the country of Babylon. But 
after a period of time, they were allowed to return to their home country of the promised land, as we know it as, as, as Israel. And God sent this prophet Malachi to minister, to be the pastor of the people who had returned to their home country of Israel. You know, you'd think that there would have been people that were on fire for God after God had just punished them by saying, you know what, I'm going to take you away from your homes. Your homes are going to be destroyed. Your country is going to be destroyed. You're not even going to be able to live in your country. And that's what God had done. You'd think that there would have been a spiritual resurgence in Israel, the likes of which nobody had ever seen. And there was for a certain amount of time, kind of like after 911. Do you remember after 9-1-1 and, and the, the jets hit the World Trade Towers? People came to church in droves for the first one, two, three Sundays after 9-1-1. But then after that, everything fell off again. Same thing with the people of Israel. Originally, when they got back to Israel, they had enjoyed a, a, a bit of a spiritual upswing. People were talking about God. People were worshiping in God's house. People were spending time on God, keeping God as their priority. But then after a while, after 10, 20, 50, 70 years, when Malachi was serving, <clears throat> it was gone. And the spiritual apathy was there. The spiritual indifference was there. They could have cared less about God. They could care less about worshiping God in his house. They could have cared less about what God had to do in their lives at all. And so, so in the book of Malachi, you find this question and answer back and forth between the people and God. And it's really interesting because you see the spiritual indifference of the people. The people were complaining, God, do you even love us anymore? Because I find no evidence of your presence, of your love for me anywhere. If you did love me, you would have not allowed me to get sick. If you did love me, you would have allowed me to keep my job. If you did love me, if you were a loving God, I wouldn't have as many problems in my life as I do. Which sounds very familiar to us today because we find the same questions running around in our own minds. And God seems like he has to be put on the spot to prove or to give evidence of his love for us as if he hasn't already given us enough evidence in that of sacrificing his own son to be the savior of the world. God puts, is put on a spot to say, I have to prove to you that I love you, even though I sent my son to death on the cross for you. But that's what the people were looking for. This was the question that they had in chapter 2. Where is the God of justice? Everything is so unfair in my life. Where is this God of justice that promises that he's going to judge the wicked and reward the poor? Malachi's answer was essentially this. You know what? You want to meet God? You want God's presence? You will meet him someday. You're going to meet him face to face. And it's going to be on judgment day. And then the implied question is, are you ready to meet the God that you don't believe is with you? Big law, right in the people's face. But then after the, the prophet Malachi, there's really radio silence in Israel for about 400 years. We don't hear about anything in, in Israel's history from the time that Malachi was off the scene, about 400 B.C., till the time that Jesus Christ arrived on the sea, scene again, and, and we hear about him in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John's gospel. Just silence. Our text tells us then who breaks the silence. It starts off by saying God is going to send a messenger, actually two messengers. He tells us first, I will send my messenger who will prepare my way before me. Now who is that? Matthew, Mark, and Luke all take them to that person to be John the Baptist, the son of Zechariah that we learned about in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 3, in the gospel lesson for this morning. Because they quote Malachi's verses here from Malachi chapter 3. And so they say, well, the messenger that is going to prepare for Jesus is John the Baptist. He's the one that's going to be that strange guy out in the wilderness preaching the repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But then Malachi talks about a second messenger, a messenger that is going to come to his temple, it tells us. Who's, it wasn't John the Baptist's temple. It wasn't anybody's temple. The only 
the only person that the temple belonged to was God. It was built to God and for God. And the word, word translated <coughs> messenger is also the very same word that is translated angel because literally that's what the word means. It's an angel of the Lord. The very same word that around the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, when we're talking about the angel of the Lord, we're talking about Jesus. So, so the first messenger is John the Baptist, but the second messenger is Jesus himself, the angel, the messenger of God, which is a, a prophecy that Christ is coming. And that's why you hear the words of Malachi chapter 3 in a lot of Christmas services, because they're actually referring to Jesus himself. So, so what was he coming to do? What was Jesus coming to this earth to do? It wasn't enough for the people of Israel that the promised Messiah was going to come to forgive their sins. That wasn't good enough for them. They wanted more. How about a God that is going to listen to me now? And how about a God who is going to give me what I want now? And how about a God who, who gives me stuff that is really important rather than forgiveness of sins and spiritual peace and, and, and Christian hope? They, they wanted basically a, a, a little bottle that you rub it. Remember what was I Dream of Genie? You rub the bottle and all of a sudden Genie pops out. And, and what do you want, Master? What can I give you? That's what the people of Israel wanted. They did not want a God who would give them what was best for them. They wanted what they thought was best for them. They wanted an earthly Messiah, not a heavenly one. But the messenger of the covenant, again referring to Jesus himself, is the one about whom Jeremiah spoke of later. This is what Jesus would do. And this is what Jesus was going to be good for. In chapter 31, we read this. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put their law in their minds, put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, No, Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And then this is the best part. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. That's the kind of Messiah that we need. That's the kind of messenger, that's the kind of savior that we really need. A savior kind, the one that can and is willing to forgive our sins. Malachi describes the Savior's work later and in and, and, and more fully detail in verses 2 and 3. He will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Yes, Jesus is the launderer who uses that cleansing soap that scrubs and scrubs things clean. He is also like the refiner who works with, with precious metals and, and fire, hot fire, to do what with that metal? To make it more pure. Instead of 98% pure, they burn it, they heat it, they melt the impurities, and it's 99.9% .9 pure, which can be a, a, a painful process. And you and I know that it's a painful process because you and I have been refined by Jesus' fire and we have been washed by the launderer's soap. Sometimes it comes when God puts a big dose of the law right in our faces and says, this is what the Lord declares and this is what you are doing. Compare the two. You are sinful and this is what you deserve because of your sins. We are confronted by the demands of God's law and we understand the demands of God's law and we understand the punishment for God's for breaking God's law. But yet God refines us and God puts us through painful processes in order that we might be more pure and more pure. What what's better? <clears throat> to to have that go through in our life and escape the fires of hell or to not be refined in this life and to endure the fires of hell. It's kind of like a, a parent who is convinced that, you know what, I really don't want to discipline my child because I don't think it's good for them. I think it's going to hurt their image. I think it's going to hurt their, their self-image. What's going to happen to that child when they grow up without any discipline whatsoever? 
as opposed to the parent who says, you know what, the God, the, the God of the Bible says that discipline is good and it's helpful for training and it's good for parents who want their kids to turn out to be decent human beings when they grow up. What's better, the parent who thinks that they love their children so much that they're not going to discipline or the one who loves them and shows that they love them because they discipline their children? God loves us too much to leave us unprepared for judgment day. And so he disciplines us. And he, and he uses himself as the refiner. And he uses the launderer's soap on us sometimes. And he gives us pain. And he gives us problems because he wants us to be cleansed. He wants us to lean on him. This section from Malachi's his work, his, his book here, is very similar to the New Testament gospel lesson for this morning. When we read from Luke chapter 3, the first six verses, about what John the Baptist was going to do. Do you remember what he quoted from Isaiah? The mountains are going to be, have to be leveled. The valleys are going to be, have to be filled in. The crooked ways are going to have to be straightened out. The rough places, the rough roads are going to be, have to be made smooth. What was Isaiah talking about? What was Luke talking about? What was Jesus talking about when he talked about John the Baptist? about what God's law does. Our pride needs to be broken down. Our despair needs to be brought up. The crooked ways of sin in our own lives need to be straightened out. And who is going to do that? And how is he going to accomplish it? Accomplish it? Jesus does it through the repentance of our sins. You know how big days in our life sometimes are, are enjoyed only after a whole lot of work? And, and for example... A graduation. You, you graduate from high school or you graduate from college even especially. And, and, and what is that a culmination of? A whole lot of hard work in order to walk across that stage and, and receive that diploma after four or five or six years or however long it took you to graduate. Parties are great. Weddings are great. But there's a whole lot of work that goes into those parties or weddings before it ever happens or before that ever happens comes. I remember the work that it took to build that fellowship over there, that fellowship hall, 20 years ago or whenever it was. Beautiful dedication day. Lots and lots of people. A, a great big party to thank God for allowing this fellowship hall to be built. But I also remember all the people, all the hours the days of volunteer labor and, and contributions, all the work that went into making that fellowship hall a reality on dedication day. Work and preparation precedes the party. Same thing with heaven someday. Before we reach heaven, there, there's a lot of work to be done. And I'm not talking that work that we can do in order to get to heaven. I'm talking about Jesus preparing us and doing the work in us to prepare us for judgment day. Now is the time, while we are still living and having breath on this earth, to be ready for that big day. And, 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 and then when that day comes... When judgment day comes and you hear the trumpets and you see Jesus coming back, what are you going to have in your heart and in your mind? Peace. Perfect peace because you have been prepared for that particular day. The, the same kind of peace that the angels sang about on, on, on Christmas Eve night, glory to God on how, how do they sing again? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. That's the kind of peace that we're looking for. That's the kind of peace that God gives us. It means that our sins have been paid for by Christ's blood and righteousness. It doesn't mean that we will never have troubles or hardships in this world, but it does mean that he will help us to deal with those problems because God has made peace with us through Jesus. And because of that, we look forward to perfect peace in heaven. Thank God for gift number two. Behind hope, God gives us the gift of peace this Christmas. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.